So often when you're building out a web application, you are gonna wanna bring in something such as a WebSocket server so that your users can get live notifications when their data updates or when a user sends them a message, et cetera. So I wanna talk a little bit about how WebSocket servers may be set up in your scenario and also about how they may scale up uh, behind the scenes. Now I will say, what I'm gonna teach in this diagram, I haven't done on production at scale. I personally would reach for an existing WebSocket service. For example, we do a lot of AWS stuff at where I work and API Gateway WebSockets API can allow you to have a lot of people connected and sending notifications between users, but I won't get into that. I'm just saying that this is theoretically how I would do it. So let's set the scenario. Let's say you're building out an application that allows users to send messages to other users, okay? And we'll have like a WebSocket server here. This can be in Go or Node or whatever language that you want. It doesn't really matter. But the idea is that there is a WebSocket server running here listening for connections. And this is going to be a stateful service, right? So a user is going to come along and say, hey, I need to go ahead and create something. Uh, I need to send a message. So this will be the first step. Emit a hello message to everyone that's in, like, for example, your chat room. Let's just call this person Bob. Bob wants to send a message to all his coworkers, and he is going to emit a message. Now, I'm assuming that Bob already has a browser open and that browser already set up a WebSocket connection to your WebSocket server. And we'll also assume that you only have one WebSocket server. Okay, well, we're gonna keep it simple. So Bob will emit a hello message. This will be our little like message. And that gets sent to your server, which should have some type of dot on statement or whatever way that you wanna to subscribe to certain message types. Maybe you have if statements or switch statements, but basically you get a message from the user and based on the type of message, you're gonna do something with it. So in this case, we have a message that's gonna be like a broadcast. So he wants to say hello to everyone else who is listening in his chat room or in his work Zoom call or something. So let's go ahead and say that he works with someone called Sally and Sally needs to listen whenever a WebSocket event comes in for a particular chat room. So I'm gonna say subscribe to chat room uh, work. Just call it work or something. So somewhere inside of this WebSocket server, you need to, first of all, know all of the connected people, right? So there's a stateful thing that's in your library that you're using. It's gonna keep track of all the connections that are active. And then secondly, you're gonna to have to have some type of lookup table or a map that says, hey, Sally is currently subscribed to work. So if a message comes in that's on the work channel, we need to go ahead and send that to Sally. Now you're gonna have a lot more people potentially. Let's say you actually work with people in real life. You're gonna have someone called Dave. And Dave also wants to subscribe to that same chat room. Okay, so Sally and Dave, they also need that message. So we need to figure out a way to just loop over all the people listening for the work channel and send it over to them. Now, just to give a little bit of code for context, I'm gonna look at socket IO docs and just kind of walk you through what's going on here. So typically in your front end, your client, you say socket.emit and maybe you put a message type here that could be broadcast and then you have like a payload in it, all right? Now somewhere in your server, you're gonna have a socket.on, which needs to listen to that same message type. And based on what was sent in that message, you'll be able to do stuff with it. So for example, like I said, you're just gonna write some basic code like this. You're gonna have an array of connections. Somehow you're gonna map certain rooms to certain people, and then you're gonna broadcast them all out. Now this will work great for your little small application that probably has no users, but if you have a lot of users and they're all trying to connect at the same time, there's only so much that this WebSocket server can handle, right? Now, if you use something like Go or Rust, maybe you can squeeze out more connections, but ultimately, as your application gets more traffic, it's going to scale and you're gonna to have to find a solution. And the only solution that you're gonna find is gonna be horizontally scaling it. So this also provides um, availability. So if this server were to crash, like you'd still at least have another WebSocket server open. But let's talk about how this works because now, Let's say Dave is subscribed over on this WebSocket server, right? Remember, when you open up your browser, it needs to connect to a stateful service. And if you have multiple of these things running, let's say you have three behind a load balancer, you're probably going to connect to one and stick to that one until you're done. So let's look at the scenario again. Let's say Bob brought a bunch of donuts to work and they're in the break room and he wants to let his teammates know that, hey, you guys can go grab some donuts. So he emits that message, but unfortunately he is only connected to WebSocket server one and that server happens to only know about Sally. So that message gets forward to Sally and unfortunately Dave loses out on the donut. So what approach could we potentially do to make sure that server two also knows that it needs to broadcast to anyone listening for the chat room of work? 
Now, the way I would approach this is you want to actually have something in between these two servers, a centralized message broker. Okay, for example, I'm gonna go ahead and just put rabbit in queue, but there's a lot of different ones out there. You could use Redis, you could use active MQ, but the idea is now when Bob sends that message over to server one, server one is going to send that to a message broker. So if you don't know what a message broker is, you should probably go read about it, but basically it's a service that sits there as a centralized way to pass messages to and from other services. It's also Kafka, if you heard of Kafka, it's one. But the idea is that you send this message to RabbitMQ or to whatever topic that you want, and you have these other servers that are basically going to subscribe to that topic. So that message comes into the message broker and then it is going to go to all the other services who happen to be subscribing to that message. Okay. And then finally, that can actually forward the message to Dave. So this is going to allow you to horizontally scale your WebSocket servers because you can have multiple of these things behind a load balancer. You don't care where these users connect to because you know you have a centralized way to basically broadcast messages to everyone else. So with that being introduced, let's talk about what happens internally. So typically when you're using a message broker, you'll have something called topics. So we're going to go ahead and just make this a topic and we're going to get a rabbit MQ and just make this more generic. So we'll have a topic over here and let's just say this is just messages. And so anytime someone sends a message, you're going to forward that message to a topic. And typically you're going to have different servers, like your internal web APIs or your other WebSocket servers. They're going to subscribe to a certain topic. Now I will say some of these message brokers have ways to do filter expressions so that you can actually subscribe to like a subset of messages based on events or keys or things like that. But the idea is you'd have all these different servers. Let's say you have like, you know, three because you have a lot of traffic. They might also want to listen to whenever a message is sent in so that these things can also get an event too and then do something with them. And if it turns out that we don't have any people listening for the work channel, we just delete the message. We don't do anything with it, okay? So that's kind of a behind the scenes view of how you might want to scale up a WebSocket server. Again, you could probably squeeze out quite a lot of connections on a single VPS using a decent runtime or programming language. But if you're lucky, you will need to scale up at some point and having a message broker, something also that can provide a high availability and high message throughput. Now, unfortunately, you do have a centralized service that's handling all these messages. So if this thing were to crash, basically you're stuck in the same situation where Bob can't actually broadcast an event to all of his users. So that is where something called Kafka comes in. Kafka is also a type of message broker, but it has a lot of built-in ways for distributing the load so that you can have a large cluster of all these Kafka nodes that are handling the messaging. Now, if you go ahead and Google Kafka, it's gonna say Kafka is a durable message broker that can handle millions of messages per second. Now, I wanna point out this word durable. Durable means that when you send a message to the broker, it's going to persist that somewhere so that if the node or the service were to crash, when it comes back online, it has information about all the messages that it received so that you have more durability of retrying events in using events. Now, it can handle millions of messages per second. So eventually, if you had millions of messages per second, which I mean, if you have that, uh, I congratulate you. Now, I'll be honest, I've never used Kafka before, but I assume it has something that's similar to Topics and RabbitMQ or ActiveMQ, et cetera, all these queuing systems. Typically, it's the same idea where you have like this, this thing that you can publish an event to and other services are subscribed to that thing. All right, that is all I wanted to talk about in this video. If there's anything I said incorrectly or you just want to kind of chime in with your two cents about this scenario, let me know in the comments. Other than that, have a good day. Happy coding.